our keynote speaker for this evening. He himself is the president of two great organizations impacting the lives of thousands of people. A person with a remarkable zeal for life, motivational speaker, please welcome Brother Nick. And when you come to times of impossibilities, God's strength will give you all that you need to get back up like this. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to jump off the table to demonstrate. I'm going to do a backflip and then land on the floor. Okay? No? Why not? Oh, you love me. Are you ready? Are you ready yet? You're not ready yet. How about now? Ready? Here we go. One. One, two, three. I'm joking, man. Are you serious? I'm not crazy, man. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Here we go. Crazy for Jesus. Here we go. I won't fall off the table. It's okay. But let me just demonstrate something to you. Sometimes you fall down like this. <laughs> Hello. So what do you do when you fall down? You get back up. Okay. How? You see, it's supernatural for a man without arms and legs to have joy. And that supernatural joy can only come from a supernatural God who is the giver of joy, of love, of peace, of patience, of temperance, of kindness, of meekness, of self-control. I couldn't do this on my own. Many people ask my parents, how did you raise such a good-looking son? How did you do that? No, you know what my parents said? They said, we did it one day at a time with Jesus by our side. My mom and dad, they were pastoring a church 11 months before I was born. They pastored a church. They had courage to have a second child after me, even though the doctors warned them that it could happen again. They have no idea why it happened the first time. My brother was born. My sister was born. They have arms and legs. Praise the Lord. But you know what? I have to say that the Lord has given me more than my brother, than, than that, that he's given my brother and sister. It's not that he's taken away from me. You want to know why? I thank God that I have no arms and no legs. Just so I can save one other soul. Can you imagine? I'm not even 26 yet. We've spoken through the media to 500 million people through newspaper, TV, 400 million of which what just happened right now, last week here in India. And we've reached another 150 million approximately all around the world. Plus, it's closer to 700 million, really. It's really closer to 700 million people. We've seen face-to-face, -face, 2 million people face-to-face. -face, and face-to-face, -face, I've seen 160,000 souls come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you something. Don't you see now why I'm thankful? I would rather have a hell of a time going to heaven than having a heaven of a time going to hell. Hallelujah. And when you go through a hell of a time to go to heaven, you're bringing hell with you to heaven. You're taking people out of hell, out of their pits of depression. You can save another soul. I love Reinhard Bonnke when he said this. What does he say? We are plunging hell, populating heaven. Hallelujah. And I thank God that I am fulfilling His will. 
not my will, but your will be done. Because if he answered my prayers, imagine if God answered my prayer at age eight. And God gave me a miracle. No arms, and, uh, no, arms no legs, now limbs. Would 160,000 be in heaven? That's the price. To the point where you can thank God for the meaning of suffering, the meaning of circumstance. God is with you. Who can be against you? One more thing. Victory is not when I get up. Victory is when I know I cannot do this on my own. Faith, F-A-I-T-H, full assurance in the heart. I have full assurance in the heart. And my God is with me and His grace is sufficient. Praise the Lord. Let me tell you two quick stories. When I was a child, I wished that I met somebody else like me. Because too many people with arms and legs would come up and want to encourage me and say, Nick, everything's going to be okay. And I'm thinking to myself, everything's going to be okay. He's like, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know my pain. You don't know the future. How can you tell me that? No one was on my same page. And I wish that I met somebody else like me. Imagine if I was seven years old getting teased at school and I felt so alone. But then one day I met a 25-year-old man without arms and legs. And he comes to me and says, hey, Nick, hold on to God and God will hold on to you. That would be hope. I never met that older man. But when God doesn't give you a miracle, you become a miracle for somebody else. 55-year-old man, now he's 55, he says, Nick, I'm 55, I'm dying of cancer. What hope do I have? I said, do you know who Jesus Christ is? He said, yes. So I said, so because of Jesus, you know who you are. You know why you're here. And you know where you're going when you're not here. He said, yes. I said, so you have hope? Yes. I said, what if you meet another 55-year-old who has cancer, dying of cancer, but not hope, but you have that hope and you're able to bring that hope of Jesus to him? Would it be worth it? Some people say, but what are the chances of me meeting somebody just like me? Well, last year in California, I met a little boy in a church with no arms, no legs, and a little foot like mine. And I looked at that boy and I'm like, wow. Got the father up on stage. He held the 19-month-old boy. And everybody cried and cried and cried. What a miracle it is. And not by luck, chance, or coincidence, but God made sure that I now am the miracle for this little boy that when he goes through school, he knows that he is not the only one. And if God has a plan for Nick, then God has a plan for me. And his mother, for months and months and months, was praying to God before she met me, Lord, if you're out there, send me a sign that you haven't forgotten my son. Bam! Miracle. If that ain't a miracle, I don't know what is. I don't know what is. God can use you. And that's our purpose, is to populate heaven. You don't know what you can do for somebody else. Let me tell you one last story. I was on a plane one day. Here's another plane story, okay? I was on a plane one day. And I was traveling from Phoenix to Los Angeles. And I'm on the plane. And then my cousin, he's sleeping next to me. Okay, he's sleeping. And we arrive on LAX. And we, you know, touch down. Everything's fine. And then we pull to the side of the runway. And we just stop there. And I'm looking out the window. And we're not moving. I'm like, what's going on? I'm getting impatient. So the 
Pilate speaks on the intercom. He says, ladies and gentlemen, we are so sorry for the inconvenience. We're waiting for another plane to leave our gate so we can go there. We need 15 or 20 minutes of your patience. So sorry for the inconvenience. And he stops talking. As soon as he stopped talking, God spoke to my heart. Now, how do I know that it's God speaking to my heart? First of all, I would never have come up with this idea. Second of all, I know that it could bless somebody. And I didn't want to do it though. Like, but God. You want to know what he said? He said, Nick, since we have 15 to 20 minutes here on this plane, I want you to get up off your seat since you're a preacher. Get up off your seat, walk to the front of the plane, and preach. I said, what? I said, no, 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 no. I'm thinking to myself, wait a second, was that Satan? But was that me? I don't know. I said, God, that can't be you. No. And it wasn't going away. And I know that if I don't do it, I'll regret it. And I look at the seat outside and I said, God, you don't want me to break the law. I'm supposed to be still buckled up. I come up with all these excuses, Lord, I can't do it, I can't do it, no, no, no. What am I going to say? What are they going to say? Wait, 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 wait. They're going to jump on me. So you know what happened? This is what happened. So I said, okay, God, I'll do it for you. So I get out of my lap seatbelt. Lap seatbelts are not effective for me. And I get out of my seatbelt like this, just one, two. I slide down my seat and I start walking down to the front of the plane. Now everybody's seated. And it's so funny when someone sees, you know, they, they look inside their head and then they see this head right next to their knee. They're like, woo! You know, like, I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Woo! Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's like, Hi, sorry. Yeah. Woo! You know, it's just like all the way down. Okay. I'm exaggerating, but it's funny. Okay. So, but I did scare some people. I said, how you doing, man? Good night. All right. So I go down to the front. And I see two lady flight attendants, and they look at me, I look at them, I say, look, I'm, I know I'm supposed to be buckled up, but I'm sorry, I'm from Australia. <laughs> and so they laughed, and I said, look, I'm a motivational speaker, and I was wondering, since we have a couple minutes here on this plane, I was wondering if I could encourage your passengers about how God has helped me in my life. Now, this is illegal! Illegal! The first lady, she went white in the face, man. She got pale as a ghost, you know. She's so scared. Oh, I'm going to get fired for my job, you know. And then the second lady, she said, no problem. She gets that microphone, puts it in front of my mouth. And I preach on the plane for seven minutes strong. I finish preaching on the plane. And I go back to my seat. Everybody's, you know, giving me high fives, you know. And I get stopped by this Jewish woman. We're talking about religion and all these sort of things. But before I knew it, we were at the gate, okay. And everybody from my seat to the back of the plane gave me a hug. Because I said if they didn't give me a hug, I would run after them. <laughs> and the last thing they want through the airport security is a man without arms and legs running after them saying, They got my wallet! They got my wallet! <laughs> they don't want that. So they all gave me a hug, but there was this one man. Here's why I tell you this story. There was this one man who waited very, very patiently for the end. He's crying crying, crying. He wanted to be the last hug because he came up to me and he couldn't even speak. He was so emotional. He put his hand on my shoulder and he says, Nick, you have no idea how much those minutes have changed my life forever. <laughs> Hallelujah. Can we have uh, Nate up here, please? Help me close. Please. In Isaiah, Isaiah 60.
Isaiah 6 is not about India, but there's some things in here that's beautiful. Worship is thanking God and serving God come what may. More than a conqueror is worshiping God whether he changes a circumstance or he doesn't. You see, he is more interested in changing your heart. Yes, believe for miracles. Miracles happen. But there is no greater miracle than to know who you are in Christ, why you're here in Christ, and where you're going when you're not here through Christ. I want to just read just one verse, one verse. It's about a nation that is touched by God. Isaiah 60 verse 18 says, No longer will violence be heard in your land, nor ruin or destruction within your borders, but you will call your wall salvation and your gates praise. Back in verse 11, your gates will always stand open. They will never be shut day or night so that men may bring you the wealth of the nations. The greatest wealth are souls for the kingdom of God. The greatest investment, I'm a financial planner and accountant, and I told the newspaper article girl, I said, I am the wisest investor in the world. She said, really? Yes. And she knows that I lost some money here in stock market the last couple weeks. But I'm the wisest. Why? Because money is nothing. Our body will fade. Money will fade. Things will fade. But make today count that you Fulfill the will of God. Don't let your purpose fade away. Don't let your joy fade away. Don't let your worship fade away. The stem of the sword of the Spirit is the truth. And the truth is, God is worthy of our praise. Come with me. He's the worthy. God's faithfulness never changes. Isaiah 40, 31 says, Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. You see, an eagle doesn't wait for the storm to pass before it flies. An eagle flies above the storm. I am an eagle, not because I waited for a circumstance to change, not because of this, not because only because I waited upon the Lord and continued to bring Him the praise He is worthy of. I said, Lord, I trust You. And that's all He needs. Man, if you have questions in your life, every question that you have tonight can be answered with one question from Him. And I'll ask it right now on behalf of God to you. The question is this. I know your pain. Your tears are a language I understand. I know you're broken and you don't understand. But will you hold my hand? Will you trust me?